today on the Rise of the Challenge podcast. You know, I, I was good at a lot of things because everything I got into, I just studied and, it, and I was very diligent about it and I learned it and I became an expert at a lot of things. And when you're an expert at a lot of things, it's, you know, it's easy to get lost in what should I do or what can I do? Um, so I was like, you know what, I'm going to take three months off so that I can just figure out what I want to do. And two weeks after getting out of the Navy, I had a job because <laughs> I got bored. Welcome to the Rise of the Challenge podcast. Joining today, he's a Navy submariner, author, and entrepreneur. It's Jeff Barnes. How are you doing today, Jeff? Doing well, Alex. Thanks for having me here. We're so excited to have you on the show to talk about your rise to the challenge. What we like to do with all of our guests is go right to the beginning. Talk about where you're from and what you like doing growing up. <laughs> uh, well, originally I was from Southern California. Currently, I live up in the Seattle, Washington area. And all I liked doing when I was a kid was playing baseball. Uh, that's pretty much all I ever wanted to do. <laughs> but <laughs> Um, didn't, didn't end up in a career path, unfortunately for me, but that's okay. That's a different story, but that's what I spent most of my time doing was playing sports and, um, just having a good time. Was there a specific team player that kind of helped you it, with the passion of baseball? Yeah. Well, I was, you know, growing up in the LA area, I was a huge Dodgers fan during the eighties and Kirk Gibson, Oral Hershiser, Brett Butler, Steve Sachs, those kind of guys. Uh, funny thing is I was actually just on a call with Steve Sachs just a little while ago okay. talking about that. So, um, yeah, you know, I was just watching all of them and getting it. We went to Dodger games all the time when I was a kid. So it was just a really good time to, to watch them play and have fun. Was there a specific position that you preferred? I was a pitcher and third baseman. What a combo. Definitely had to have the arm for both of those positions. I did up until I ruined it. Yep. In my uh, junior year of high school, I ended up uh, ruining my arm so bad I couldn't couldn't really pitch ever again. Was it ruined because of the repetition with how long you played for or just those positions in general? Yeah, that was a big part of it. Um, we'd end up moving to Colorado when I was 12 years old and I played in the snow out there getting ready for a tournament that was going to be taking place in Australia. And, uh, you know, when you're 16 years old, you don't really think much about warming up because you always feel good. And then one day, all of a sudden playing baseball in the snow, my arm didn't work quite as well as I used to. And, um, I remember the moment it happened, I went to throw the ball and my arm just stopped and I could feel something snapped in, inside me. And apparently what it was is that I ended up uh, having a rotator cuff injury and, there, shortly thereafter, when football season picked up, I ended up getting a dislocated shoulder. So I dislocated my shoulder a few times, tore my bicep tendon and my rotator cuff and had to have surgery to repair it all. With it going through the surgery, did it kind of lose the passion of wanting to continue with sports after or did it give you the opportunity to go in a different direction, find something new that you enjoyed? Well, I'd always wanted to play sports, and so I didn't really know what else there was or what else I could do. I was good at being a mechanic at the time and uh, was pursuing that, but I always wanted to get back into sports. Unfortunately, I was too stubborn to follow through on all the physical therapy and didn't do it all properly, and so as a result, I was never able to get back into it. So, yeah, I'd say I wouldn't be where I am today if it hadn't been for that that injury. As you're growing up, did you have anyone in your life or someone that was a big motivator or inspiration for you? I mean, just the the men in my family, my grandfathers um, and my dad, just always working their butts off and seeing what they were able to achieve with their bare hands. Um, they were mechanics. My, my grandpa on my dad's side was a motorcycle PD down in Los Angeles and I had three grandfathers and all World War II veterans. So a lot of respect for them um, and what they'd gone through hearing some of the stories and things that they did, you know, and, and no World War II vet or I think probably any war vet actually tells you the real um, tragedies and travesties that they witnessed while they were in war, but they, they did do a good job of telling the fun stories at least. Did that give you kind of the mindset of wanting to pursue down that path at that time with knowing sports wasn't going to be that opportunity, but now ready for that next spot? Not really. You know, the military was actually, um, you know, a happenstance kind of situation for me. I had no idea what I wanted to do. And it seemed like the most logical thing to do at the time, given that I didn't know what I wanted to go to college for. And that's, that's how I ended up down that path. But I'd say that having that in my family uh, really helped me. I would, I don't want to say I was prepared for it, but at least be honored to, to be a part of it. Out of all the choices, what drew you towards the Navy? 
I liked the water and I wanted to see the world. <laughs> that was about it. Yep. When did you start going in that direction? What age were you? What did you do to prepare for that? Yeah, so my junior year of high school, it's actually my sophomore and my junior year of high school, uh, when I had my injury, I was like, all right, well, what else could I do after my surgery? Because I had my surgery when I was 16. And I was like, all right, I'll start looking into this. And I'd seen, you know, at that time, Charlie Sheen's movie, Navy Seals had come out. And so I watched that. I was like, oh, that looks really cool. And so back then, you could actually request information from the military and i requested the training program because about buds basic underwater demolition seals teams and they gave you a full um training regiment and it was about that time i also realized i was never going to be a seal because i could not do enough push-ups or pull-ups because of my shoulder injury it was just really really painful now had i known then what i know now that could have been a very different story but at the time i just couldn't couldn't make it through and so um, seeing that I was like, okay, well, I'm probably not going to be a SEAL, but it looks really cool what they're doing. And then I actually signed up to become, uh, to join the Navy a year before I graduated high school. So I actually, the first, the last, my senior year of high school, I was actually in what they call a delayed entry program. So I already knew I was going to the Navy long before I even got into my senior year. With people that have interest in the military, sometimes they see like what you did with the movies, TV shows that kind of put that different perspective on what is the military and the kind of the fun aspect of it. Would you, what would you say to someone who is going in that same direction, looking at the movies, looking at the TV shows, and how did that change your opinion when you actually got into what you did on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, well... Hollywood glamorizes everything. Let's just put it that way. Um, what they don't show you is what real life actually looks like in, in the military. And not only that, but even if you see it, you don't know what it's going to feel like emotionally. And, you know, we had, you know, I went through scuba school um, in 2005. And at that time, they said that the attrition rate was somewhere in the 50% range. And you think about that. And if you're one of those people that just, you know, is really excited about doing something, but you don't think think about how they're actually trying to get you to quit. And most yeah. people have never put in, put in a situation up until that point in their lives where the people who are supposed to be coaching you, mentoring you, leading you and teaching you are actually trying to get you to quit. And they do that for a very particular reason. They don't want weak-minded people in certain situations. Um, on a submarine, you don't want somebody who's going to be claustrophobic and freak out. You don't want somebody who's going to run away from a fire. You want somebody who's going to put the fire out. You don't want, when you're you're diving, you don't want somebody who's going to freak out if their air turns off. You want somebody who's going to be able to figure it out so they don't shoot to the surface and kill themselves. And so in the military, they are actively trying to get you to quit and give up. Um, there's an old movie, G.I. Jane, and there's a, an iconic scene on the beach where they're just like kicking the sand in their face and the water washing over them. They're doing everything they can to get these recruits to, or, or these, um, yeah, I guess you can call them recruits still, trying to get them to wash up, right? And, get, and go ring the bell and kick and get out. And it's because they know if you don't have the fortitude to go through this, then when the going gets tough and we're actually in a field of battle and something's going south, are you gonna have my my back or my, my six, right? And so they need to make sure that they push you to that that limit. And I'd say that no amount of watching any movies is going to make you experience what that feels like. Um, but once you do and you've overcome it, it's a pretty in incredible experience. Was there ever a moment that you wanted to quit or when they were trying to make you quit, you still were rising to the challenge and overcoming every obstacle that they put in front of you? Um, you know, physically and mentally, no. I, I never really ran into that i mean you get to a point physically you're like okay i don't think my body can go on anymore when you're in the ocean and it's 49 degrees in the water and you're swimming around it's like okay that's that's pretty challenging right but you're doing it because you've told yourself you will and there's people relying on you um the politics of it though man that made me want to quit all the time i couldn't stand working for certain people and that that was maybe more of my personality than anything else but I take a lot of pride in my work and getting things done and uh, being results oriented and having people put roadblocks in your way to prevent that really makes it challenging. And so I would get really tired of that. That's why I didn't make it a career and stay in for 20 years. I just didn't want to deal with that the rest of my life. What would you say during your time in the Navy was the biggest transformation you saw in yourself? Mm -hmm. 
I would say that, you know, when you go from being one of the guys, so to speak, and you're just sort of the the new guy and the young guy, you can get away with not being perfect, not and you're not you don't have a ton of responsibility. You have to get your job done, of course, and people are expecting you to get your job done. But when they all of a sudden put you in charge of the same people you were friends with, mm-hmm. and that's the position I found myself in, then it takes on it gets a little bit awkward, right? Because now you're required to be the leader and they don't really give you any leadership training, right? It's kind of trial by fire. But they expect you to figure out how to lead, figure out how to get these people to do their jobs when just the day before you were, you know, horsing around with them and goofing off and not doing your job and doing everything you could to avoid responsibility. Now, all of a sudden, you don't only have to take responsibility for yourself, but that for your entire division. Um, That's a big transformation, you know, and anybody who's gone through that, I think, would say the same thing if they took a minute to think about it. Did you ever see yourself from a sports aspect as a leader that was able to transition into you being a leader without having that kind of the title or the kind of that path? Yeah, looking back on it, yes. Um, but at the time, no. You know, I when I was a kid, I remember I broke up a fight uh, when we were down in Australia for this tournament one time. I broke up a fight between our team from Colorado and another team from Texas and the, the, these Texas guys were a lot bigger than us. <laughs> they could have taken us, <laughs> no problem. But I broke up this fight, you know, just using my words. And I was a scrawny kid at the time, 15 years old or whatever. And, um, you know, I wasn't thinking about leadership. I wasn't thinking about, you know, taking charge. I was just thinking, this is not the right thing to be doing right now, guys. And so we should stop that. And I think that a lot of people that become leaders don't gravitate towards it because they want to be in charge. They want to be a leader. Some people do, but I think a lot of the times it's that the world gives us an opportunity to rise to the challenge and step into that leadership role. I love how you pointed that out because sometimes leaders don't need that title. There's some kind of moment that kind of sees them step up to the plate in a way where that is where true leadership is because you kind of see a different side of them, a different skill set come out that you didn't even know that that person had. And you kind of look at some people that have that title and they're not a leader in a way Mm -hmm. just because they have that title. So I always love that kind of the underdog leader that comes up out of nowhere and kind of performs at the level that a leader should be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you you can either command respect or you can demand it. And it's much better to command respect just through your actions than it is to demand it by uh, virtue of authority or position. How long were you in the Navy for? Six years. During those six years, was there a moment that was kind of like a favorite, like something that you remember as the good times during that six year time frame? Um, You know, there's plenty of them. You know, most of the times it's just with your buddies having a good old time or we're in port. I remember we were in, uh, Tokyo for Thanksgiving one year and obviously they don't celebrate Thanksgiving in Japan but we had just gotten in and we um, had taken a train we're going to take the train from uh, you know somebody who's still in or knows the geography better is going to lament this with me but it's either Yakuza or Sasebo but I think it was Sasebo we had to take the train and we got off in this place to go check out the great Buddha and we walked through this um, you know park and we got pictures and it's just absolutely beautiful really cool culture and we walked out a different place than we walked in and so of course we're completely lost and none of us have you know this is before smartphones we don't have gps around we don't have a way around the maps that we do have are in japanese so we can't read any of them and we have no idea where we're going we're completely lost and it's getting towards dusk and we're like okay we should probably not just be out here dark, after dark not knowing where we are and we went to this restaurant and um, we're going to try and ask if somebody could help us figure out where we were. And this little old lady is, you know, speaking Japanese and she's obviously can't understand what we're saying, but it's really funny when you have a group of like six or seven, you know, white American dudes come in, their eyes get really big. They're like, oh my gosh, you know, these, cause we're way taller than all of them, but she looked a little bit scared. So we left Yeah, we just walked out and walked away. And next thing I know, she's running around the corner yelling at us and waving us down. And I'm like, did you guys like steal something? You say something? What's going on? Like, why is this lady chasing us? And she comes around the corner and she's like, wait, wait, wait. And she gets this little girl. And this little girl is maybe 12 or 13 years old. And she has her translate for us. Turns out this little girl has 
spoke enough English and it was her granddaughter um, who was able to translate enough for us to be able to figure out where we were and where we were going. And then they walked us to the train station, which was several blocks away, so we could get where we were going. And I'll never forget that. I don't know who those people were, of course, but it was this this situation where I was in a new culture that I'd never experienced before, getting to see how other people interact with each other and realizing that there are a lot of really great people in this world who are just willing to help, even though they don't expect or get anything in return. I love that story. That It just shows that a lot of times when you go to those countries, they don't know what's going on when when you arrive there they might just trying to analyze the situation and that woman just wanted to help you even though mm -hmm. you guys may not even knew what she was wanting when she was running at you or running towards nope. you or you guys no were idea. Going. <laughs> did that have you been to japan since your time in the navy and got to really experience from a different perspective i haven't unfortunately no i've been other places but not back to japan near the end of the six years did you kind of have an idea of what you wanted to do next? What was that next chapter for you? No idea. Um, at the time, I didn't. I knew that I was tired of being told what to do, so I didn't want a boss anymore. I wanted to be my own boss, but I didn't know how that was going to work out. I tried financial planning. I tried investing in real estate. I tried a few other things. Nothing. Nothing really took. Nothing stuck. And I just, you know, I was one of those people that. You know, I, I was good at a lot of things because everything I got into, I just studied and, it, and I was very diligent about it. And I learned it and I became an expert at a lot of things. And when you're an expert at a lot of things, it's, you know, it's easy to get lost in what should I do or what can I do? Um, so I was like, you know what, I'm going to take three months off so that I can just figure out what I want to do. And two weeks after getting out of the Navy, I had a job because <laughs> I got bored. And I got a referral to a company and it checked all the boxes. I had three main requirements. I'll never forget when I got out, I was not going to work in nuclear power ever again. I was not going to do rotating shift work and I was not going to work in a cubicle. That was it. Those were my only three requirements. Um, and this box, uh, this job checked all the boxes. I got to work from home. I had my own company car. I got to travel all over the place. I didn't work in nuclear power. I did some engineering stuff and then uh, risk management, but yeah, checked all the boxes. I said, all right, well, let's go for it. And that, that was a 12-year-long career at that point for that one. Was the transition to civilian life an easy transition for you? Or was there moments that really took a toll on you? So I never saw combat per se. Um, I was a Submariner. We were doing reconnaissance types of missions. We would pick up SEALs and Marines from time to time. And we would we were spying on other countries is what we were doing a lot of the time. So I didn't have to witness some of the atrocities of, of war like some people do, um, even though I was in at a time where we were going through that. And we were, you know, over there in, um, uh, let's see, Bahrain, you know, shortly after 9-11, which Muslim country, Muslim world. And we were not entirely welcome. So you got a feeling for what it was like, but I never had to experience war. So I didn't have uh, what I would call those those major issues that a lot of folks, I think, experience. Um, I hadn't suffered the same types of loss that I think a lot of people do. So for me, it wasn't as big of a transition as a lot of people might think. The biggest transition for me, and I think this is the number one challenge that most veterans face, is lack of purpose all of a sudden. Um, you you are taken away from your brothers, the people that you've known for a long time, that you've lived with, you've worked with, you know, every it, nook and cranny of their lives and vice versa so you're taken out of that and also you're taken away from the mission and when you are taking taking when you take those two things away from a person it's really easy to get lost and so what i ended up doing was i just poured myself into learning um, i ended up getting my mba i got my my nuclear engineering technology degree i just learned as much as i possibly could i poured myself into books and studies and and all of that and no one really tells you when you're, I, mean, I guess maybe some people do, but you don't really understand it when you're in that you're never going to have the same friendship that you had while you were in. You'll never be able to rekindle that kind of thing. So my friends from, you know, 20 years ago are still my best friends, even though we live all apart in this country. So it was, it took a toll mentally from that perspective to realize that you've essentially been, you know, disconnected from purpose and and, and the friends that supported you in that, that endeavor.
You talked about the career that you were in for about 12 years, but talking about your professional life, how did that fare with your personal life? Were you able to kind of still enjoy being Jeff and out there doing the things you want to do while still having that professional career learning as you're going and things like that? Yeah, I had a, I had a cush job. Um, I was, you know, working from home. So, and I was on, I was driving early in the career. I was doing about 30 to 35,000 miles a year in a car. So I was on the road all the time. So I had plenty of time to listen to audiobooks and CDs and, you know, you name it. Um, then towards the end of that career, I was flying everywhere. I was doing about 60 to 80,000 miles a year in the air traveling. And so again, I was allowed, that was me having my downtime. Whenever I would be in a car or on a plane, that was my time. And I've spent a lot of my time alone. Like even still to this day, I work from home. I don't have to go into an office. So again, no cubicles for me. Um, and it's been great because for me, and I think this is something a lot of people probably need to figure out for themselves is what is it that's going to fulfill you in your life? What is it that's going to make you feel like you are actually, you know, you know, significant, have value, uh, fulfill your your ambitions and your dreams. For me, it's traveling and it's spending time with the people closest to me that I love. I don't need a, a wide array of friends and a whole bunch of people. I go speak and I go talk and I I deal with uh, consult or clients and whatnot. And so as a result, I get to see people all the time. But then I get to stay in my own little cocoon in my world and do things my way and, and be separated from the mass hysteria of the general populace, if you will. As an entrepreneur, what do you do and what do you specialize in? So I would say that my, my main specialty is being able to understand where companies and opportunity fit in the, the broader ecosystem. And that's kind of hard to explain, but if you look at what I do is I, entrepreneurs come to me all the time with ideas and they are coming to me because they want help growing their business or raising capital. That's what they want. I've raised over, or I've been, I shouldn't say I did it, but I've been involved in over a billion dollars in capital transactions and have been instrumental in a lot of people raising a lot of money. And what I know and what I can see is how to take somebody's idea, somebody's product technology or whatever put a story around that and help it make sense to somebody else who's never heard of this product or technology. And as a result, they can either raise capital, they can get customers, they can grow their business, they can build a team around them and so on. So my specialty is, is really kind of matchmaking, if you will. And it's putting ideas together with either capital or mark, go to market strategies so that people can grow their companies. But ultimately my passion is, is freedom and autonomy. And so the entrepreneurs that resonate with what I do and how I do it, they don't come to me because, you know, they just need help with marketing or they just need help with a system or they just need help with technology. They're coming to me with the problem of, I work my butt off. I'm working way too hard. I really don't want to work as much as I am, but I really do want this thing to succeed. How do we do that? Right. And so that's where I kind of come in as I help them navigate those waters. Where do you feel that people are connecting with you the most and coming to you? Is there a sp specific moment from your experience that they're like, I can see how he went through something and it's similar to my path? Or are they finding you from different avenues from other people that you've worked with and it's kind of like a connecting way? Yeah, a lot of people come to me via referrals. Um, that's actually the big one because once I've worked with somebody they then know my capabilities and they know how I can help other people and just, it comes naturally. The other is when I go speaking. Um, so if I'm on a stage and I'm speaking about whether it's marketing or technology or um, exiting a business, things like that, then I, I generally attract a few people to us that are looking for that kind of help. As an author, when did you kind of get that niche to kind of wanting to write? You know, it, I, I have to say it was never about wanting to write, quite honestly. I don't like sitting down and typing at a keyboard. It's actually really obnoxious to me. I have dyslexic fingers, as I like to say. They type in the wrong order. Um, but what happened was in 2009 you know, through 12, we were dealing with a recession. And we were dealing with a massive loss of people's wealth and their retirement plans. 
And I had a, a friend in our business who at that time was planning on retiring. And when the financial crisis happened, the company who owned us was AIG. So our share price went from $62 a share down to less than 20 cents a share. And this was a major hit because most of his money was tied up in AIG stock. And so he ended up having to delay his retirement for five years. Well, at that time, I was also investing in real estate. And my partner and I said, hey, we can go help these people that have money in their IRAs. We should go help them and show them how they can self-direct and invest in real estate. And I was talking to mentors of mine. And, and every single time we talked to somebody, it was the same story over and over and over again. And so finally, somebody, my mentor says, hey, just write a book about it. Write the book. That'll be your calling card. You can give them the book and then they'll know you're the expert in that thing. So that's how the ultimate guide to self-directed investing and retirement planning came around. Um, and then it was pretty much the same thing when I wrote All Hands on Deck. I was sitting in a room and I gotten away from doing real estate investing and helping people with their retirement plans. I wanted to do more bigger business consulting. And these, I, I couldn't figure out how to position myself. And so I sat on stage with a group of peers around me and these are all very successful people. And I said, I, I don't know how to position myself. I don't know what to say to get people to want to do business with me and what they said is okay then what did you do and how did you get here and so i told them well i started my career running a nuclear power plant on a submarine and and they stopped me so that's it that's what you're going to write about you're going to talk about how you did that and how that relates to business and we talked a little bit about it and they said you just need to go write a book about this so then i sat down and about three months later we had all hands on deck so that's that's how both of those came out it was uh, literally through the prodding poking and prodding of other people to put this in action and right now I'm working on my third book, which will be a little bit different topic altogether, but along the same lines of freedom and autonomy. During that time of the recession, did you take a hit personally from it or was it kind oh, of yes. a learning <laughs> experience? Yeah, you? I lost uh, I lost several hundred thousand dollars through real estate um, during that time. And that was not a lot of fun. I lost plenty of money in my, my stocks and mutual funds, but I had a lot tied up in real estate properties. And so I ended up actually having to I uh, had a couple properties go under, and that was not a fun process to deal with at all. How did you kind of have that mentality to get back up and kind of keep on going? Sometimes people would kind of go in a completely different direction just to kind of stay afloat. Yeah, you know, I get asked that question a lot, and it's kind of funny that that question even comes up to me because it's like, well, what was the option? What was the other? What was the alternative, right? Am I going to go bury my head in the sand and ignore it? Um, at that point, um, I was married we were having our first kid and, you know, you got a family to support, you got people around you that are relying on you. Um, you don't just tuck tail and run. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I don't know if I would say that I was raised this way, but cowardice is not in my blood, you know? And I think that there's, there's something to be said about just toughing it out. And, you know, you don't learn by running away, right? You learn and you grow through hardship and enduring it and figuring out what it takes to come out the other side. I feel like that connects with what we talked about earlier with how that kind of moment was pushing you to quit in a way, but you didn't quit kind of like how you were with the Navy. They're trying to tell you to quit, but you're not going to quit. You're going to get back up and continue and fight through it. So you were basically doing that fighting through that time and saying, I'm going to get over this and I'm going to keep going. You found different avenues to go. You still were doing the things you wanted to do, but this moment was going to not make you quit in any way. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, again, I had three grandfathers who were in World War II. Um, one fought in the South Pacific, another one over on the Eastern um, side on the and then I had one who was actually Czechoslovakian Jewish and escaped in a, a concentration camp and was able to survive and tell a story about that. And having heard some of the stories that they've told uh, told me when I was a kid and then reading books like Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning and uh, other ones, it's like, you know, people have real problems in the world, like serious real problems in the world. Money is not a real problem. Um, having your ego bruised is not a real problem. Having your pride hurt is not a real problem. Um, even being cheated on, it's not a real problem. These, these things suck and no one likes them. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're not fun and no one wants to deal with that. No one wants to go through that because it is painful, 
But these are not life-threatening emergencies that are going to cost you everything and everyone around you. And so when you start putting things in perspective, and I can't remember who said it, but I think it was actually a Napoleon Hill thing when he's talking to W. Clement Stone, when W. Clement Stone was uh, passing away, he said, at the end of the day, nothing that we do matters, right? And that's a hard pill to swallow when you think about it, but the earth's going to continue turning. The sun's going to continue coming up, right? Humanity will endure in some way, shape, or form. And that doesn't mean that we are insignificant and lack value, but it does put it in perspective like, hey, you know what? This is not the end of the world. When you're not working, what do you like to do for fun? Unless working is fun for you, so <laughs> you can say that, but what else besides that? So like working is fun. I like to learn new stuff. Um, you know, I do all sorts of weird things to learn new things from time to time. Um, I, I coach Little League. So I coach my son's Little League. I get to go watch them. And I have two boys that are in sports. And it's just, you know, constantly going here, going there and doing all that. Um, so that takes up quite a bit of my time. My wife and I love to travel when we can. So there's that. And, you know, we we live out here in the Pacific Northwest. So there's plenty of stuff to do outside. I have a gym in my garage. I work out three to four times a week and I blast the music as loud as I can, as long as my neighbors can stand it. And uh, yeah, I do that. I, I learn, I spend a lot of my time learning. You know, I'm always trying to learn something new. I spend more time learning about health and wellness than I think most doc. well, I, than I know most doctors do because most doctors don't learn about that stuff. But um, you yeah, know, that's the stuff that I really enjoy, you know, paying attention to what's, ha what's happening in the world around me and then thinking about it, not just taking whatever the media gives me at um, face value. So, yeah, those are uh, what I call them fun. I mean, they make me feel better. Hey, that's fun for you. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a go to on how you like learn? Do you prefer like the courses, the audiobooks, the podcasts, the kind of the scene through videos? What kind of format is your preference? Actually, all of it, really. Um, there's a time and a place for sitting down and reading a book, a physical book, and putting having that tactile feel and having your hands on it. Because there's one thing that technology is never going to replace, and that's at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, it might take a few millennia of evolution for it to happen, but our brains work in a certain way, right? And our senses need to be fully involved in something in order for us to ingest the information. Physical books are a great way to do that because you actually you have a tactile feel of the page. You can shift things back and forth. You can see it. You can you can even smell the books, right? You can feel it, all of that. So I like that. I also like the fact that on a book, I can flip back and forth without having to scroll and, you know, click and find where the heck this thing was. I can dog ear a page and go right back to it. So that's great. Um, if I'm traveling, I have my Remarkable. I can load a PDF on there and I can take notes on it. I can always listen to audiobooks. I have, I think I have like 200 audible titles that I've listened to in my library. I have a, on the other side of this camera here, I have probably another 200 books and physical books that I've read and I read fiction to my kids uh, to put them to bed. And so, you know, I, I love reading books. I love watching videos at 2x speed <laughs> where I can, <laughs> as long as I can understand the person, because I like to ingest the information. And for me, it's not about the process of getting, it's about getting to the understanding. And the understanding is on the far end of ingesting the information. So however I can ingest the information um, leads me eventually to that path of understanding. The final question I'll ask you for someone that's listened to this interview based on your journey and experience, what tips or advice would you give them to overcome obstacles, accomplish their goals and rise to the challenge? I'd say the first thing that you have, the first and most important thing is you just have to believe. You just have to believe you can. Um, most people fail in life because they, they don't have any belief in themselves. They are unsure of their abilities. This nonsense notion that you fake it till you make it. I, I really despise that saying um, because a lot of people take it the wrong way. Like you have to pretend like you are someone you are not as opposed to being true and authentic to yourself. Like I was told that when I was early and I, I always tried to fake it, fake, tried to fake acting like I was, you know, a know-it-all. Um, I hated that. I felt so incongruous with, with my principles and my beliefs. And it was when I finally started being authentic and true to myself that I was able to actually rise and 
figure out how to do things or figure out how to find the people around me. So what I would say to somebody who, you know, whether you're early in your career, you're still in school, you're, you know, midlife or later on, and you've been kicked around a few times, you just have to believe that at some point things are going to work out. Because if you have that belief that things will work out, then you won't stop, right? Um, I'm trying to remember who said this to me, and I wish I could give them credit. They said, you have to imagine that if you're in Los Angeles and you line up a trail of people from here, from Los Angeles, all the way to New York City, and these people are just shoulder to shoulder all the way there. Somebody in that line has your million dollars, has your hundred million dollars for your investment, for your business, for your whatever. And if you knew you were 100% certain that that person was in that line, what would you do? You would just go person by person by person and talk to them until you finally found the person. They might be all the way on the far end. But if you know and you are certain that the solution to your problem is somewhere in that line, you will continue going. And so that's what it is, what it's all about in life is just being certain and believing that there is a solution to whatever you're facing and you will continue pushing towards that. Jeff, I want to thank you so much for coming on the show and talking about your rise to the challenge. You're inspiring so many people and we are excited to see what the future looks like for you. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. I appreciate it. Tune in next time to hear my next guest talk about their rise to the challenge. Remember to follow, subscribe on all major audio platforms. And make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel to get full-length episode and video format. What path do you take to accomplish your goals? You decide.